Yes, my friends, we will now see for the first time on television this priceless scene and many of them from the Hunchback of Notre Dame with Lon Chaney Sr. Because you asked for it. There's the bell of the cathedral. Now, I think if you'll watch very closely, the first sign you will see that I express to you on my hand is fear. There it is. There. Uh -huh. See? Yes, yes, that's it. No, no. Now, I think that shortly, shortly it will go into an expression of hate. Not the complete sign of hate, but a good deal of the sign. You see, these various things that I've explained to you are... Oh, yes. are not yep, complete that's... signs, uh -huh. but they are portions of signs from the mute language. This oh. is the mob trying to break into the cathedral. That's uh, right. To get him and, and, and the girl. That's right. I believe the next sign that you will see that is similar oh. to the mute uh -huh. language would be frustration uh, followed by determination. Uh -huh. There's frustration, uh -huh. see? Oh, here he comes to get that great big timber. Mm -hmm. He throws that down upon the crowd. He was a powerful man like, uh, like you were, too, huh? Wasn't he? Oh, he was a very powerful man. There he throws it on the crowd. That's right. And now watch the exhortation. weapon again. Ah, the battering ram. Mm -hmm. Don't let that fool you. What does he do now? Now you know. Oh, like There's rage. Mm -hmm. What? See these cauldrons? Uh, they're filled with molten lead. Oh. He intends to tip them over. And let the molten lead flow on the crowd below. Ah, down the gutter. Wow. Buzzard. Behoves thee, fair maiden. I will 
make you a great singer. Beloved. Gee, Kitty, you were wonderful. Ah, curses. Ah, help. Kitty, where are you? Kitty. If you ever remove this mask, I'll... What does a chicken say when it lays a square egg? I d -d don't know. Ouch! Ouch is correct. <laughs> Yes, Lon Chaney was all of these. The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the Miracle Man, the Phantom of the Opera. The world, fascinated and thrilled, called him the Man of a Thousand Faces. But what was the secret Lon Chaney hid behind his thousand faces? What was the mystery in his life? Now, for the first time, the true story, torn from his heart, comes to the screen. Starring James Cagney, magnificent as the fabulous Lon Chaney, master of the grotesque, the weird, the strange, and Academy Award winning Dorothy Malone and lovely Jane Greer as the two women who made his life more astounding, more touching than any of his unforgettable roles. I'll come to see you every week. Every week. I promise you. 
You had me fired. Damn you! Damn you! Damn you! Who are you? I'm from the collection agency. I've come to collect my wife. <laughs> Good evening, goblins and ghouls, and welcome to the Friday Night Scream Stream. I'm your host, Spakenstein, joined as always by my very good friend, Mr. Evan Sink. Good evening. How are we doing tonight, Evan? We're copacetic. Wait, what? No, hold the phone now. We're we're what now? We're, we're copacetic. There's your word for the week. Uh, that's a, my word for the year. Uh, what? Uh, define, please. It means we're doing great. Because it's Friday, hey. it is our favorite day of the week. It is hopefully yours as well. It better be your favorite day of the week, otherwise we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna come right through the screen and we're gonna make sure it is your favorite day of the week from now on. Uh, no, we hope to just do that with our wonderful show tonight, as as we do every Friday. Uh, you know, we kick it here on Fridays. We've we said it before. Every Friday is a party because we're watching public domain horror movies. Um, some classic, some not so classic. We're going to reach uh, out and touch you like some kind of phantom. Yeah, some kind of, yeah, phantom touch. That's our, you know, we're getting, uh, we're maybe getting a little romantic. No, uh, this is not <laughs> that kind of phantom uh, that you may be familiar with. Of course, we are watching one of the most iconic, probably the most iconic silent horror film out of the United States, uh, and that is The Phantom of the Opera from 1925, starring Lon Chaney. This is a, you know, th this is definitely considered one of the greatest um, silent horror films, if not one of the greatest horror films, just because of... The performance that Lon Chaney gives as the Phantom, but it's not, you know, it's kind of an unconventional monster, but it, he is kind of considered a kind of in the pantheon of, of monsters. And because of that, this movie has become iconic and so you know, it is among the best of the best. And of course, last week we were with the worst of the worst, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you tune so in, we, we switched gears. It went big time. That's if you're new to this show, which thanks for everybody tuning in tonight. I see S Sync is in the chat. Welcome, oh, S Sync. Hope everybody else tuning in tonight is doing great. Uh, but, you know, if you're new to the show, you know, we kicked off season eight last week with Plan Nine from Outer Space, which again, as we talked about, this is considered by some to be maybe the worst movie of all time. We didn't find it quite to be that. We had a lot of fun with it. Unfortunately, if you were watching on YouTube, we kind of got a little interrupted and got it all sorted out, got it all taken care of. I won't harp on it. Uh, <laughs> suffice to say, we're back here this Friday. And so we go from the what you, some may say is the worst of the worst to cream of the crop. And that is this show. That is what we do here. A very quick pivot from something really kind of ridiculous and over the top and and not in a good way unintentionally to again a movie that this is a silent movie say what you will i mean again if yeah, fresh was here we know that he would say plenty what year uh, are we looking at we are looking at 1925 okay um wow. 
So we, of course, we've only had a really a handful of silent movies on the stream because, again, they're not everybody's cup of tea and they're not necessarily my cup of tea. But we have seen another Lon Chaney film on the show, and that is Hunchback of Notre Dame, which was from 1922. So we're getting about three years after that. Um, yeah. So, uh, we're, 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 you know, this was basically his follow up to Hunchback of Notre Dame. And both movies come from Universal, um, Universal Pictures. Uh, they were definitely looking for a follow up to Hunchback. And then, uh, the producer, Carl Limley, of course, uh, read the book. Which, if you didn't know, Phantom of the Opera is based on a novel uh, by a French author uh, named Gaston Leroux. I don't know. I, I'm not going to be good with the French pronunciation. I'm terrible with it. And this is a, this is all set in, you know, the opera. We're going to the opera tonight, if you didn't know. So I hope you, I, I tried to get a collared shirt, get a little bit fancier <laughs> than normal dressed up tonight. since we're going to the opera tonight i got my fleece on yeah i'd say it's well you know you want to be comfortable my, my dress fleece you gotta settle in at the opera because you're gonna be there for a while <laughs> same with this movie again we always joke about it but it's true our silent movies are the longer movies that we watch on the stream which is some people may find unfortunate but you know it's just a different kind of storytelling um and so this movie again like i said it's really just considered iconic for nothing else than because of Lon Chaney Sr. I don't really need to say senior because <laughs> he was never, he never was billed as that in his lifetime. He never called himself Lon Chaney Sr. So we'll just, when I say Lon Chaney tonight, know that I'm not talking about Junior. We all love Junior. Junior's great, but we're. If we're, uh, if we're talking about Junior, we'll call him Junior. We'll call him Junior. If yeah, if he comes up tonight, which he will, uh, we will call him Junior. Uh, but no, we're watching. You know, we're watching the the master at work here. I mean, the, if you saw the trailer coming in from our pre roll, this was the man of a thousand faces, um, and you know he really served him up. And so, uh, you know, speaking of uh, serving up, uh, we've got the uh, man of a thousand drinks over here. Our very own Mr. Evan Sink. Get ready to serve up another delicious cocktail to pair with the evening's film in a little segment which we call... What were you drinking? What are we drinking this evening, Evan? Well, so oh, Garrett is taking us to the haunted opera tonight. But I like to think of it as a phantom zone. Ooh. We're hanging out with the phantom tonight. We're going to be all up in a phantom zone uh, with General Zod, all the rest. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm calling tonight's drink. It's the phantom zone. So this is a uh, kind of a, a creamier take on a chocolate martini so it's a dessert cocktail it's gonna be very sweet very creamy if you want to make this at home it's equal parts vanilla vodka creme de cacao and heavy cream and a little bit of cream of coconut so uh, just for added creaminess we're going all in <laughs> just a hint just a hint, just a hint. Yeah, you're not you a big wanna... coconut guy like me yeah well, this is not this is not a coconut Hopefully, shouldn't be too much of a, a coconut drink. I I think I think you have got the proportions down exactly right. I'm very excited for this. Uh, and you know, I mean, last week we had. I know it was vodka because it was Ed Wood, so we were trying. <laughs> yeah, we had the what was it? The, uh, the, the vodka. Oh, gimlets. the Corpse Survivor. That Corpse was Survivor. and that was like very strong. Strong. Yeah, that was very that this, wake you up. The limit. This, this should hopefully be a lot more smooth. Well, I had spaghetti tonight, and so when you see this is a dessert cocktail, I'm thinking, oh, this is like the perfect thing. <laughs> yeah, on this top will of this will uh, this will soothe your your stomach. You'll like even out all that acid. I, I the, need that. Yeah, I was the, getting the a little sauce. feeling a little bit of that burn burning up of that that acids slowly building up, but. 
Yeah, this this very creamy cocktail. Yeah, it on looks a, like it's a very, glass of cream. Yeah, it really <laughs> does just look like does. A, a glass of cream. <laughs> very so thick. Is, it's it's real thick. Yeah, real real thick tonight. Um, it smells good. It does. It smells yeah, chocolatey. It smells like chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, but creamy, creamy as hell. Mm -hmm. So right. I, I think without further ado, <laughs> we're gonna give this a try. This is the Phantom Zone. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm, that's really. I took a small sip too, and I think that's just fine. I don't think yeah. I need a big sip because it's yeah, it's, it's got a little bit of a bite to it. It does. It's stronger than I was expecting. It's strong, so I'm definitely gonna be. But it, yeah, it's 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 got a bite. Definitely creamy. A little bit of an afterburn too. Mm -hmm. It kind of settles nicely. It's like oh okay, that's it's got, got a good a taste. Bit of a, I like uh, that. Getting the chocolate, the vanilla. Yeah, the chocolate definitely stands out like above all. I'm really yeah. not even getting the coconut. Yeah. So yeah, um, much, me so. being a little <laughs> you know what over here. Classic. Um no, this is perfect. And again, you know, for for the movie tonight, I think, you know, get nice and nice and rich. Nice yeah. and you know thick. I mean, this is a thick movie. We've got, we got a dummy thick movie and a dummy thick drink. <laughs> Me too. We are just, yeah, doubling up tonight. I mean, it is really, it's like, and again, and and so I, I will go more into this later, but basically there are two main existing cuts of this right now that I had to choose between showing tonight. And it was really hard to decide, but one of the biggest differences between the two is one's longer and we're watching the longer one, but apparently you get more story. Things are a little more filled out. Um, there's, there's a lot of differences. I, again, I'll, I'll kind of wait to go into it later. Cause it's really convoluted a lot to wrap your head around. But I mean, essentially this began, you know, Lim the, the head of the studio, Carl Limley, went to Paris in 1922, read the book in a night because he met the author. The <laughs> author gifted him the book. He read it in a night. It was like, it's a page turner. We got it. We got to make this, and this will be perfect for Lon Chaney. Like, because they still had Lon Chaney under contract. Um, I think shortly after tonight's film, he left for MGM and was on, under contract with them until he passed away. But, he was at Universal, so Carl Lim was like, oh, he'll be the perfect Phantom. Like, this will be great. So immediately sets it up as one of their prestige productions. And Universal had, like, a whole system where this was called a a, a, a jewel. This was a jewel production. Like, okay. they had different stages. And jewel <laughs> meant most, like, lavish prestige production. And so it really was their like follow up to like when you go to the casino and you get the like you're you're a platinum tier member. Oh, yeah. Special. This is yeah, no, this is the most luxurious. This is only for high rollers only. Um <laughs> that was definitely what Uncle Carl was cooking up here as they like to call him at the studio. Um cuz he employed a lot of his own family cuz he had a huge he had like it came from a family of like 13, like sibling, you know, it was like him and like 12 other siblings. So a lot of his like siblings and nieces and nephews worked for the studio. And so then everybody around the studio would just start calling him uncle Carl because, <laughs> and they said universal is like a family. So, you know, universal, I've always had like a soft spot because of their horror movies, obviously. And tonight's film really kicked off unofficially kicked off their horror series it's not really considered i mean really dracula is considered the start but this is like the this was the match you know this was the flame that ignited mm -hmm. the you know the universal monsters as we know them and um but it's not one that you know again i mean it's a silent movie that's obviously that can be a barrier for some people yeah i was gonna ask so if this is a silent movie how are they gonna do the songs well, oh man, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but um, hope you've uh, hope you've memorized those songs really well. You feel like <laughs> doing some singing. Yeah, it's okay. I'll, I'll do them myself. Rocky Horror Picture Show style. You're gonna you know perform with the movie. You just sing the songs yourself. I think. 
That's the only way we can do a silent film. Yeah, um, something about keeping the, your hand at the level of your eye. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, this is one of those like things as a silent movie, um, as a kid, I... I, you know, was give, you know, would get copies of these movies for Christmas because again, public domain, they're pretty prolifically produced and distributed. And so I'd, they'd pop up in something, a gift I'd get for Christmas and I'd put them on, but usually at some, you know, some early point, if it wasn't interesting, I'd tune out and I'd be doing something else. And, you know, so that's the nice thing about this show is it has gotten me to complete, you know, watch these movies in one sitting. Um, and so far we've, we've watched Nosferatu, which I hadn't seen Nosferatu all the way through. Hadn't seen the Golem all the way through. Hadn't seen Hunchback all the way through. Had watched Caligari all the way through a few times. I really, I mean, out of all four of the movies I just mentioned, Caligari is like by far the shortest. It clocks in at like <laughs> 70 minutes, you know, 74 minutes. Makes the, other ones, easier. You know, the other ones are over an hour and a half and you're like, oh, all right, like you're really, and they're more drama heavy. Um, Nosferatu's better, but it's definitely Golem and more so Hunchback. They're very drama. Mm -hmm. Tonight, I mean, we're getting horror you know, in the sense that the the character that Cheney plays is much more a villain than the hunchback, um, a little less sympathetic. But we'll see all that tonight. And you know, I was you know referencing owning copies of this as a kid, and I always like to break these out. So this was the <laughs> very first copy I got right here. Oh wow! I was a part of a five VHS. Is that a spoiler? So, what? What he looks like? Yeah. If you don't know what he looks Space. like now, I didn't know what he looks like. Oh, Evan, you haven't seen you've seen that face before, haven't you? I mean, you? probably. I probably didn't know it was the Phantom. Though. Damn, I should. If I, what are you like? <laughs> the only I'm spoiler alert. I used that in a project in high school. You had to have seen that. I <laughs> okay, surely, yeah, yeah surely we, I, I saw point. that 15 years ago. <laughs> you surely you remember that. <laughs> um, no, I mean it is. It, it has been kind of this image is because it's public domain. It's been proliferated a lot, but. I, I, now I'm hesitant to show my other copy oh, that no, I have. It's, it's okay. It's okay. You can uh, show it. I got, I'll just but, close my eyes. I basically got these consecutive Christmases. That was my VHS. This is my DVD copy, which I've shown this before because I've shown it when we watched maybe Nosferatu and you see Caligari here and the Golem. And so we're finally, we're finishing this collection off. This is the last movie in this collection we haven't watched okay, yet. Well. So should be... Uh, should be pretty good. Oh man, Evan, I feel like I spoiled it for you now. <laughs> Damn, I feel terrible. No, it's okay. It's okay. I, oh. I'll, I the unmasking I, sequence is the reason why this is considered a horror. You, I'm not gonna keep asking you because we're about to watch the fucking movie, so it's not like I need to drive it home any further. But I'm just have, I'm. A little shocked, a little disappointed at myself for not checking. I meant to ask you earlier if you'd seen this or not. And is anyone in the audience uh, also not seen? This? Yeah, did I just spoil the look <laughs> of the Phantom for you too? Uh, just if I did, if I haven't, just go to Wikipedia, spoil it for yourself now. We'll all be on the same page. I mean, it looks pretty monstrous. I, I don't think you, you know, you. It it would be hard to say that this is not a universal monster looking like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's very well, and this is why I would say it really is kind of the start in the sense that, in terms of the hallmarks of a universal horror film, I mean, usually makeup is like number one, and this is a movie where makeup ends up being number one. And we'll talk later about how Cheney achieved this makeup, what he did, and it is pretty ridiculous, you know. I mean, <laughs> the man was willing to go through a lot to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> to come up with something really horrifying and he you know he really he did he 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 was What's successful. The, so in the in the story did something happen to the phantom or is he just born like that we'll go into that uh I, there yeah, i guess we'll, we'll see there are reasons the the movie everything does something <laughs> different it seems like <laughs> um every movie does something different that's the beauty of of the phantom as a kind of it ended up becoming a 20th century pop culture kind of touchstone and, you know, 
the movie and just the story being adapted or kind of parodied or you know not just in movies but in television and and all these other things throughout the 20th century no not so much now um outside of the musical you know phantom is not like anything crazy but i mean we'll talk tonight about just how kind of iconic it was at least in the last century um and i mean it, it, it's it's kind of it, <laughs> I, I, there was one other thing I was gonna say. I can't remember. What, I've I've lost my train of thought. So I think I, I won't. I won't. I'll remember it later. I'm sure. But um, this is really kind of the start of Universal's or you know or monsters. This is the start of the Universal monsters. So really excited to get into this tonight. Uh, anything before we before we crack this movie open tonight, Evan? Uh yeah, Cheney rules everything around me. The cream, nice, terrific. <laughs> well, on that note, we're gonna go ahead and get into the exciting beginning of Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom of the Opera. Let me get it right. Every time that we watch one of these movies now, ever since Evan corrected me on the little shop of horrors, I'm always like, <laughs> all right, like, because I'll, I'll, I'll subconsciously just drop the the. Uh, I, I've been doing it on everything I've written today. I'm just want to say of Phantom Opera. of the Opera. Well, not the second. <laughs> if I was dropping all of these, we'd the really Phantom have a problem. Phantom of Opera. We'd really have a problem. Um, although uh, my fact sheet does get pretty uh grammatically incorrect when i'm trying to save space uh but unfortunately we got another two pager here tonight so what are you gonna do um i know i know i, I gotta i gotta remember how to do it uh sweet feet which welcome sweet feet sweet feet's in the house uh wait, so that so we're uh sweet because of sweet Feet. i know you saw that earlier we're uh, going with the original 1925 cut so that was ultimately I did a poll. I forgot to say this. I did a poll over democracy in action. We got a, you know, what I'm really struggling like today. This was a really hard decision. So I turned it over to the audience on YouTube. We so, got so it delegated delegated out of the audience. Classic me. We got 100 percent on YouTube for the original version and so that's what we're watching tonight what the people want what the people wanted so uh it's it's again it's a little rough around the edges but it's the again what the audience would have experienced when they first watched it so um authentically crispy very yes that's a good way to look at it absolutely well, on that note we're gonna go ahead and get into the exciting beginning of phantom the god Damn, the, 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 the Phantom of the Opera right now. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Like, oh my God, even trying to find, there were like a million different scores like to choose from too for this is really ridiculous. And there was like, there were original scores, but they don't survive. None of them have survived. YouTube poll, Sweet Feet. Uh, I did a poll on Twitter and a poll on YouTube, and I had a, uh, the YouTube poll had uh, five for this version. Yeah, how'd you choose the score? <sighs> it was tough. It was more, when I had the, getting this version it just it was going to be this score like but the other version there were like a billion different scores so when i was like really trying to decide about the other version it was, it was like man which one do i want and so yeah obviously i didn't say this earlier paris opera house is the location of the film that is the titular opera and there, this is the opera house we're going to see in the film is designed to look like the real Paris opera house. It is basically, I don't know that it's an exact replica, but some people have 
been known to say that it was an exact replica. Um, but it was built on a, a sound stage, um, which ended up becoming very famous, Stage 28. And it was used for decades. Um, that's obviously a model. <laughs> I think that's a, that's definitely like a um, some kind of a model or something but you'll see like the set it's it's yeah oh, wow so this is a huge sound stage and this stage was still in use until the last few it was demolished in 2014 finally but they saved a lot of the sets that still survived and they're in storage now um universal goes so hard with the sets I mean, we saw the cathedral for Hunchback, right? So this was them trying to outdo that. <laughs> so Raul is our leading man, Norman Carey, the young hero. Got all this opera drama. And you know, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I forgot. You know a little something about the opera, Evan. I've been to the You've opera. You've been once to or the twice. opera. I've never been. I'm not sophisticated enough for the opera. It's it's a lot like this. People standing around in the lobby, their fancy get up on. Talking and like, you know, a little hum drumming, mm -hmm. you know. It's... Some guy with a sword and a, a pith helmet. Mm hmm Little old maid taking your coat. <laughs> little scrub woman. Yeah, I mean, so these sets still exist. They've just been <laughs> removed from this soundstage, which was demolished. But this soundstage is, uh, I mean, it was like the first soundstage with steel girders. That's why it was able to be used for so long. It kind of seems like they just built an opera house. Essentially, that's... <laughs> What they, but you'd be surprised the mo and I, I really didn't get a list of it because there are too many other facts but a list of movies that were shot on this soundstage and of course it goes without saying that it's said that Chaney Chaney's ghost haunts haunted <laughs> haunted because it's not around anymore okay. stage 28 but oh what was his unfinished business? Well, apparently the thing I read, I don't know, I didn't, there were no sources on this, was that it's when they were like trying to demolish it, that he was like, there were fatalities to the people that were. Uh, like, what is he trying to scare off the, the demolishing mm. crew? It turns out there's a lot of money hidden under the floorboard or something. Right. The Scooby-Doo plot. Exactly. That's, just, that's all it is. Now, have you seen the um, the musical? Like, the movie I've version seen the, of the musical? Yeah, the newer or... one, the musical. I've not seen this one. <laughs> yeah, Sweet Feet. Uh, Ch you know, Chaney, Chaney, you know, even though he was in silent films, the man was a colorful down to earth guy i'm sure i'm i'm sure that he was he he is an intimidating ghost using all kinds of language oh my god um <laughs> <clears throat> Privacy, please. <laughs> the musical is better. 
Uh, maybe, maybe as a musical, but they ain't got Lon Chaney. They ain't got that Phantom. This is the ultimate iteration of the Phantom. Once you once you see that unmasking scene, you'll. I mean, yeah, this one looks like, uglier. That's the point. Apparently, this really is horrifying. closer to the novel. The description of how the Phantom looks in the novel. They, they prettied yeah. him up a little bit. In the, in the musicals and really all the other adaptations after after this. This is the only one that really goes grotesque in like in the skeletal sense. Yeah, that's was it Ger yeah, it was Gerard Butler as the Phantom. And now he's, you know, now he's saving the president. Still, he's still making those movies. <laughs> Opera politics. Look at all these. Look at all these Frenchmen in their big <laughs> moustaches. These caped opera managers. <laughs> Must be nice running the opera, walking around in your evening wear all all day. Yeah, they are all caped up, man. I'm I'm gonna go over here and get my cape. I'm starting to feel left out. But Disney did a a Phantom. They adaptation. did. They did do a fan. I was gonna talk about that later, but yeah, the Phantom Team of the Phantom. Megaplex, I believe, is what it's called. I don't have a trailer for it. I do have some trailers uh, coming up for homages, but that was not one of them. The opera ghost. Ooh. That's the phantom, actually. <laughs> uh, it's not a ghost. Um, okay. You need to get your you need to get your entities correct. The scene shifter. The scene shifter. <laughs> they call me the shifty shifter. <laughs> yeah, look at this guy. These this guy's eyebrows. He's definitely shifty. <laughs> All right, this guy's get up is. Uh, <laughs> what is he wearing? <laughs> This guy's got an interesting fashion sense. <laughs> You're ready for a lot of shadow work tonight, which is really it's a very nice touch. And it's not expression. That's pretty wild. It's, yeah. I do love that. It's not expressionistic, but I wouldn't call it expressionistic. But it's, you know, it's great shadow work. Yeah, it's not slanted enough to be ex expressionist. Yeah, not as exact. Well, the directing here is not super inspired. Uh, <laughs> the everybody had a problem with the director. Apparently, it was not not good. It's got to a thick old layer of foam. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Yes, uh, Sweet Feet. Uh, it just apparently... They didn't really say why everybody was having problems with the director. They just said, like... Apparently, Chaney got to the point where they he wouldn't even speak to him. And the, the DP <laughs> had to be the go-between... Oh my god. Um it was uh the the DP was Charles Van Inger. He said that Cheney when he would tell Cheney what the director had said that Cheney would respond, tell him to go to hell. Um colorful language. Um and the cinematographer also said Lon did whatever he wanted. That was like Lon. Lon was just you know I mean and there it's said that he directed some of the scenes in this movie because you know, again, apparently there were so many problems with the director. The The leading man in the movie apparently tried to run him down with the horse. He was like on horseback. They were shooting something and he just 
charged him and the director fell over. And that was... <laughs> so they were just bullying the shit out of him, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. He just did not like this guy. It sounds like he just did not have a, a hold on his, his production. He really did not. So when... We'll talk about all the reshoots and stuff later, but when they were reworking this movie, he... He was not. <laughs> he was not back to like help them rework it. They they sourced some other directors. That was a fake nose. <laughs> Bouquet. So I don't know if it's one of these ballerinas, but one of these ballerinas is played, but one of the ballerinas is played by the niece of the producer and studio owner, Carl Lemley, uh, Uncle Carl. Uh, and she was actually the last surviving cast member um, of the film. She died in 2014, the same year they demolished the uh. random stage. <laughs> um, and she lived to be 104. Jeez, wow. Carla Lemley. Also... In Dracula, she speaks the first words in the movie in the coach. She's reading oh, from the book. Okay. So she's she was considered a horror film legend and would up like shortly before death was still going to conventions and doing public appearances. She was heavily involved, but this was her first movie. Again, I'm not sure which ballerina she is, but <laughs> she's one of the ballerinas. She's in there somewhere. In there somewhere. She's a teenager. He's got no nose. And for a nose, he's got no nose. <laughs> he can't follow his nose. <laughs> Man. No. Who was it? Who was it that would say that? Oh, Toucan Sam. Yeah, Toucan, Toucan Sam would be Sam. really disappointed. In that. <laughs> That's why he's so mad all the time. He can't find the Fruit Loops. Now, ghosts do not like to be gossiped about. That is, that's probably why they end up having so many problems. Exactly, Sweet Feet. Exactly. <laughs> oh, don't apologize. Don't you apologize. <laughs> Never apologize for nose posting. <laughs> Man, that's some major side eye. It's good at that. Reporting for duty, major side eye. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's not an SNL sketch yet, it will be this Saturday. Yeah, well, SNL's gonna start stealing from yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, that's real. That's when you're gonna really scrape it at the bottom of the barrel. Like, come on, guys, you can do better than that. The voice of an angel. I, I guarantee you Lon Chaney did not have the voice of an angel. A very gruff man from Colorado. Yeah, so Faust is like the big opera that all of this revolves around. So again, I don't know much about the opera Faust, but that is the kind of where... Other versions source the music from. <laughs> oh, I guess that shadow work is Chaney. I'm really not sure. Is him making a deal with her supposed to like parallel Faust? Like the story yeah, of Faust? Yeah, I think so. And the, it is like a deal with the devil. Yeah. There, there's a lot of parallels and in other adaptations and homages the the kind of source from both things we'll we'll see a trailer for one later that definitely sources from both 
um, in a very effective way, I think. Was that the Whispering Shadow? Yeah, it does. It definitely looks kind of like the way, you know, I don't know what it is about a, a fedora and a cape and all that making a very menacing shadow. Ooh. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> you know, so scatter, scatter. You know, look at these classic ballerinas, man. So <laughs> so graceful with the with the exclamations of horror and surprise. Quick swoon and yeah. uh, scatter. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Classic. You gotta love. You gotta love silent movies when the only way for people to know that you're screaming is for you to wave your hands around because they can't hear you screaming. Oh my god. Okay. All right. Whoa. That's cool. You gotta love theaters with like trap doors. Oh, there's a. Oh, look at this. This opera house has its own garden. Definitely a universal backlot. Faux show. <laughs> that dog was digging up the garden. Kind of make it look real. Uh, in, in the other cut that we were thinking about watching tonight, I don't even know if any of this is in it. I'm not. I was trying to kind of compare as I went today, but not too much because, again, I hadn't sat and watched this all the way through, so I didn't want to spoil it for myself. But hmm. <laughs> She's like, all right, chill out. So the, the these are romantic leads, of course, obviously. Uh, Raul and Christine, which I don't know if that's the names that are used in like the musical. I think Christine is the. I think that that's the same. But, I think his uh, name's Gerard. Gerard. Yeah, they always kind of play with they're the same. Okay. Yeah, and you know, both of these actors, much like any a lot of people in the silent era, you know, <laughs> they didn't go and really make the transition to sound very well. They were in a few sound movies, but not as leads and you know. No, no, it's kind of weird the way that like a majority of people that have like headlined, you know, prestige productions and just kind of, nope, you just don't make the cut. Although they both came back um, whenever there was a version of this put together for a sound re-release. We'll talk about that later. That gets into the alternate versions that is very confusing. I won't bog us down with that right now. Wow, so it's a pretty messed up joke. <laughs> no one wants to help you, Christine. Ha ha ha. It's just making her decision that much easier. Rumors. Rumors at the opera? I'm shocked. <laughs> I mean, the opera must have been like the big social hub of the day. The opera is like everybody's Twitter. It's just like, you know, everybody in one place sharing little tidbits of information. Eventually, by the end of the night, everything's gotten around to everybody. The gossip is being spread. It's just... 
<laughs> yeah, the the show is just the pretense. You really go for the gossip. Mm -hmm. It's all about this. So nobody goes to the opera because they like the opera. <laughs> They're going for the social aspect. You're going so you can say, I went to the opera. <laughs> I'm sorry, this might be a Seinfeld bit. We might be uh, subconsciously <laughs> borrowing from Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he wouldn't let me take his hat and coat, so I, I only <laughs> gotta assume he is the Phantom. <laughs> so somebody's letting this guy in. Yeah. <laughs> He's just flashing. <laughs> what is he flashing? Just, all right, you're good. <laughs> Promise to behave yourself. Please don't bother him. He's a good tipper. <laughs> All right. What do I know? I'm just the boots on the ground here in your little opera. <laughs> I'm just the, the thread that holds all this together. But what do I know? I just take the hats and coats. <laughs> they get scared and run away. Classic. <laughs> I just, just needed to get his composure. <laughs> oh, <He's gone>. <laughs> shocker. <laughs> yeah. scared They're out again. again. <laughs> okay, steal yourself. All right, one more time. Maybe we'll come back. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's just go. We gotta tell somebody about this. We're the people we tell about this. <laughs> oh, Faust. <laughs> God, trap doors, man. So cool. That is a wild set. I mean, that's the thing. That's not trick. That photography. That's like the set. <laughs> they have a set in their set. Thousands and thousands of extras, I'm pretty sure. Maybe hundreds. I don't know. They on their on their posters. I'm pretty sure definitely in the hunchback they advertise. And a cast of thousands, you know? It's like, <laughs> alright. These are the days when it's not like, you know, five real people and three thousand and you know, CGI people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the occupancy limit of this set? <laughs> what, was the fire, what was the fire marshal have to say about uh, this? Man, it, back in those days, well, it's got steel <laughs> beams, so this is way state-of-the-art. I don't, I don't need to approve Jack. You guys are know what you're doing here, obviously. <laughs> you guys know more than I do, clearly. <laughs> Just cram as many people in here as you He basically rebuilt the Paris Opera here in Southern California, so what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I mean, that's the thing, S-Sync. I mean, thing, you know, never caught... It, there were so many soundstage, so many movies that are lost because the buildings that they were housed in caught fire. It's crazy that it never happened to that soundstage. Uh, it just, you know, eventually it was just like, all right, it's too old, time to tear it down. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, all right. Uh, that, you're not going to believe me. Oh. Oh, is it like a flashback? Or is he there? We do on this show. We need to we need to get that printed on a shirt. We'll make sure to quote you, sweet feet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's the, exactly the energy that we need to be channeling here. Please leave. You're you're walking in here with this sword. You're really freaking everybody out. <laughs> you're supposed to leave your swords at the door. I don't know who you think you are. <laughs> Man. Put out in the cold. Definitely looks like a poor lost little puppy dog. <laughs> Charlie Brown music. <laughs> Insert here. <laughs> that was definitely the walk. For sure. <laughs> Dang creep, just waiting there. <laughs> I was not wrong about the puppy dog thing. <laughs> She's got another man in there. Uh-oh. Mm. We know where this is going. <laughs> Score abruptly changes. <laughs> exactly. Uh. We all we're all reading reading what they're we're picking up what they're putting down here. It's suggestive, but we know. My goodness. Why and why does he have his hand on his sword too? Like what is he? <laughs> he well now he's ready to go. He's on the okay, warpath. Yeah, now. he's ready to he's ready to slice and dice. <laughs> he was charging in like ready like he was about to do something. It's like well, I have no plan. <laughs> I just barged in here thinking I was going to find a guy. There's no guy in here. Anybody home? Uh. He's floating. It's a ghost. It's <laughs> incredible wire work they have going on here at the Paris Opera. <laughs> Again, the shadow. I mean, yeah, yeah. They're, they're. It's not expressionistic, but it is great. Oh, so he's the strangler now. Okay, you find you find a guy hanging, and you're you're like, all right, let's drop this phantom nonsense. We got a strangler on the loose. Oh, is it gone? No, no, fucking gone. got him. <laughs> Made this guy look like, like an a idiot. An idiot. Now nobody trusts you. Uh oh. Oh, oh there it is. Well, oh, man. we weren't looking hard enough. We're, we're really bad <laughs> stagehands. We can't can't pay attention to detail. Oh. <laughs> he knew too much. Hey. 
If only my brother weren't so well informed. <laughs> Strangled him with a lasso? Yeehaw. Brutal, yeah. yippee ki -yay, Phantom. <laughs> oh, man. Not another headache for these guys. Oh, I feel so bad for them. Poor opera management. The clowns. <laughs> Need you get sick and fast. Ill. <laughs> oh, I'll be ill. I'll be the illest. <laughs> This, 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 this chick. She ain't gonna be scared of no little old phantom. <laughs> Who are you gonna call? <laughs> You've got mail. <laughs> it's like a very thing. thickly lined envelope. It looks like a, <laughs> looks like a cartoon. Uh, it looks like a JPEG. They don't look too upset. <laughs> Phantom just slipped another note in while they were looking. <laughs> Finally, some law and order here. Thank goodness. Man, this this guy's got some information, huh? Whoa. Whoa. That's cool. Yeah. I want more like that, yeah, please. <laughs> And that is going to take us to our first. Did you ever think a break was coming? Didn't it seem like maybe I'd forgotten or something? No, it's just that long of a movie. <laughs> that was the first third of the Phantom of the Opera. What do we think so far, Evan? You know, I think it's uh, maybe just because I like I've already seen another version of the same story that uh, I've, it's. Like I, I kind I've never seen this one before, but I feel like I kind of have. Like I, yeah, you I, like I know, know the story yeah, you already. know what's right. I was thinking that too because I have like I saw the movie version of the musical. I guess around the time it came out, we rented it. I think, and I mean, I you know, wasn't really big. I don't really. I mean, it was it's not a movie that I've ever gone back to. I watched it maybe once. Or I watched it that one time whenever it played, whenever we watched it, and it, it did feel like, okay, well, I've already watched at least 
three other versions of this movie and i'm like come to think of it you know where i first watched the uh the the musical where of the opera i saw it in elementary school really yeah i had a teacher who just really loved the movie and so like i think like a couple times that year we should just she waited like, for the class a couple times yeah like, not we're, just we're, once we're, we're, yeah we're watching phantom <laughs> again guys it's phantom day again <laughs> get out well, your capes and masks welcome to the phantom zone kids oh my god i love that that's that's fun teacher i think it was just around the time my sister was into movie musicals so we rented it and we all watch it. it was you know she's big into moulin rouge mm. that was around this time of the early 2000s where these i mean and obviously phantom of course that musical came out in the late 80s and was a massive hit and literally just closed on broadway in april of this year like that's how like it had a <laughs> continuous run for that long um and i mean I, you know, Phantom, yeah, I mean, it's a story that has kind of been played on a lot, straight, straightly adapted and parodied and, you know, just kind of used as a jumping off point because it is, um, you know, I mean, this idea of a, mi a mystery man and, you know, there's romance and there's action, there's all these things, there's horror, it, it kind of... I don't know. It's easy to grab the imagination. Yeah, I it, guess. it's a thrilling story. There's a lot to grab onto. I mean, again, it started as a novel, you know, or I mean, that's that's where all this comes from. Is it, it comes from a book, which I did try to read, believe it or not, in sixth grade. Okay. And obviously, I did not make it through. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got about halfway. Like I got pretty, pretty far, good, but I was yeah. like. When's it gonna pay off? Uh -huh. I need I need something big. Where where I'm getting all this backstory about the Phantom? When are they gonna get to the songs? Right. I mean, you no. Know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> no, I I went. When are we gonna get? When when am I gonna get the reveal and see his gross face? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's me. It doesn't there, work the same in a book. A picture, you, right. You don't get the. Yeah. I was waiting for the pictures that never came. You don't get the same effects. Um. But that was the thing. Lon Chaney. You know, we haven't seen his makeup yet, but he was apparently inspired by an illustration that was like of the novel published along with the novel. So it is one of those things that even as a book, it was already popular when they made this movie and it just, this movie was a huge hit and obviously the unmasking scene was the big thing, you know? Um, but, you know, it wasn't like they just got this movie <laughs> like uh, this is one of those things <laughs> about why I have had so much to deal with with all these different versions of the movie, because even from its like. First release, they were already cutting different versions Um, basically what happened, they started shooting this in 19. 24 and then they started previewing it in like early 25 and the first preview screening that they did was in january and it was a disaster it was a huge apparently it was <laughs> oh, awful no. so um they decided to reshoot a bulk of the film they brought in a, they had another director come in um he added a lot more comic relief and they did a whole new ending because, and I won't talk about the ending now, the original ending they had, but it was not popular with the audience. So they did a whole new ending, but he had all this comedy relief and it kind of transitioned from a dramatic thriller into a romantic comedy. So they, <laughs> so that was, that was a little different. So they decided they previewed that. Uh, when did they, I don't know when they previewed that. But that was also <laughs> terribly like a terrible preview with huge negative reception. Like people hated it. So the studio hired um, these editors that had kind of like, well, a, an editor that had worked with the studio named Maurice Piver and an, uh, another 
actually a director named Lou, uh, Lois Weber, um, who's one of, a pioneering female director. Like she was a female director in the silent era and she made like a couple sound films. Um, but she worked for universal from time to time. And so they hired her and Piver to re edit this between the, the second version filmed with the second director and the first version filmed with the first director. Um, so they recut it and basically they took out all the comic relief, kept most of what the first director shot, except the ending. So they took from the new, new stuff. The only thing they really kept was the ending. And that's how they got the cut that they finally released in 1925. Okay. And they found it in the edit. They found it in the edit. And uh, the the other guy, Piver, actually was an uncredited editor on a lot of the Universal monster movies on Dracula, on Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein. Um, So he went on to have a hand in, in... Kind of shaping, even though he was uncredited, kind of shaping the way those movies turned out. But he got his start trying to fix this movie, which again, after two disastrous screenings, preview screenings, they finally hit on a good one, put it out. And apparently this past Wednesday was the 98th anniversary of its like general actual release, like okay. general release. I think they previewed the third version in September of 25 that went well enough that they said, okay, it's ready. And so they, it took them a while. So that is like one reason why you kind of have some different, some different footage. But then, as I said earlier, they ended up um, in 1929 overhauling the silent movie cut and reissuing it with a soundtrack. And so they brought back some of the actors to re-record scenes and sound. They added some new characters with new dialogue. They they changed some stuff around. Uh, but Cheney was working for MGM, so they couldn't bring him back, and they also couldn't use his voice. Um, the Like... He was, you know, he was about to start a sound movie for MGM and they were like billing it as, you know, the man of a thousand faces talks for the first time. And so, so they have like, they added a new assistant to the Phantom who speaks like while his shadow is there. So, so they did all this stuff and that ends up being a whole other version of the Phantom. So just starting back from when they first shot it, we're talking about th- we're talking about four different versions of the movie. Okay, we haven't even gotten into what we how we ended up with today. What we've ended up with, okay, but this is the genesis of how basically you can have such dramatically different cuts of this movie. You know, a uh, hundred year, almost a hundred years later, it's like, okay, why am I? Why is this take in this movie completely different from this take in this movie? Why? Is so, do all of do do any of those other things like still exist? Like, were they ever? We'll we'll talk about how they the things pop up in different versions. Okay. Um, but that because that's what we'll get into, kind of the home video. Uh, aspect which is where things really kind of how you end up with different cuts of the movie is is with home video and with with other kind of later release how much of the rom-com still exists because i kind of i kind of love the idea of a rom-com starring the phantom of the opera I think not a lot i think they ended up cutting a lot of that out like a lot of the like there were actors that that you know were added just for comic relief that were then totally cut out so i think they really did cut out most of it i mean there's been some funny stuff here from time to time but again we're watching the 25 cut this is like this is the third cut of the movie this is what they got after the two disastrous preview screenings what most people are familiar with was what came after the advent of home video and we'll talk about kind of what that led to later um but what we're gonna see for this break we're gonna see two trailers for some 
Phantom inspired movies. Um, there's some Phantom remake trailers we're going to watch later, but I feel like they kind of got some spoilery stuff in them. So I'm like, let's just save those for the second half after most of the major things have <laughs> happened. Um, and we'll watch some movies that were inspired by the Phantom of the Opera, some trailers for movies inspired. So the first is for a movie from the late 80s, which is a slasher called Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. And it is <laughs> looks, I haven't seen it. It looks very cheesy. Um and it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a slasher version of Phantom of the Opera at a mall. So you know, not really a lot that you need to explain there. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, seems fun. Um, and then the second trailer that we're going to watch is for definitely a parody of Phantom of the Opera, but also of gothic horror movies and of the rock music scene of the 70s and so much other stuff and that is phantom of the paradise directed by brian de palma um and that actually is a combination basically of phantom of the opera and faust the story of faust because there is kind of a selling of the soul to the devil mixed with literally a phantom of this music hall, but it's all reappropriated for the seventies rock music scene. <laughs> um, it is like Rocky horror, but I think it came out a couple, I mean, a couple years before the movie came out, but after the Rocky horror musical had like, cause it was a stage musical first. Mm -hmm. So in between the stage musical and the movie, you have this, which is very similar. And actually they were both produced by 20th century Fox. So I don't know why they got a wild hair in them to produce these horror movie musicals, but this is like right up there. Like I, you know, I'm kind of a, they're my guilty pleasures. Like it definitely, Rocky Horror Picture Show, but just in the last like few years, I discovered Phantom of the Paradise, and it was uh, like for some reason the Fox Movie Channel plays it pretty regularly. So I can't, I've caught it like a, a fair amount in the past like year, and it's just a great parody of of a lot of these kinds of tropes. Um, and if you love 70s rock music like I do, then I highly suggest that you check out Phantom of the Paradise. But you'll get a little taste of it when we watch these trailers. And then when we come back, we'll get into the exciting middle of the Phantom of the Opera. So stick around. We'll be right back. He's there. Behind the wall. Beneath your own feet. You all tried to destroy him. In your greed, you tore everything precious from him. But Eric remembers. What if Eric didn't really die in that fire? And now... Eric will make sure you remember too. Eric Matthews is still alive. What do you mean they know? There's no escape from the horror. There was a nightmare at the mall. Eric the Phantom struck. Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. Century Fox presents Phantom of the Paradise, a gothic horror story. What was that? 
a beautiful love story. A cinematic odyssey through the rock universe. From Greece to glitter and beyond. The story of a sound, the man who created it, the girl who sang it, the monster who stole it, and the phantom who haunts the paradise, the ultimate rock palace. Phantom of the Paradise. My music is for Phoenix. Only she can sing it. Anyone else that tries, dies. Phoenix. Phoenix. So you told me one time that you'd be somebody, that you weren't working just to survive. B. It's kind of slow. Whoa, whoa, wow. Man, you better get yourself a castrato for this. Paul Williams as Swan. And the angels that do. I want you to stop terrorizing the paradise and rewrite your cantata. And the Phantom. Phantom of the Paradise. There really is the Phantom, 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 Phantom. <laughs> there what really a... is a Phantom. Yeah, they really they really play up beef in that trailer for some reason. I don't know why. He's not really in the movie for that much. He's kind of obviously an over-the-top character for a very over-the-top movie directed yeah, that looks great. by Brian De Palma, who is one of the, like, kind of masters of over the topness. I mean, he was like huge fan of Hitchcock and made a lot of Hitchcock style thrillers, but that are way more over the top than indulgent. And then also made a lot of like, he's made mainstream movies. Like the, he directed the first mission impossible movie. Um, and the black Dahlia. And I mean, he's a, he's a kind of comes from the same school as Scorsese and Scorsese and uh and I just remember a few of those other guys but uh I Lucas and yeah he's like friend, friends with George Lucas and Spielberg and they're all from that 70s director school um and so it's a definitely a visionary like film from a, a guy who had a vision and so it's it's really it's funny the way that it plays with tropes um like, oh man, Brian De Palma really understood like his horror tropes. Like he plays with it in a way that's truly funny. Like it is a funny movie. So if you haven't seen Phantom of the Paradise, check that out. Um, we're about to get into the exciting middle of Phantom of the Phantom of the Opera. Um, and so far, um, we've gotten a lot of shadow work from the Phantom, but we haven't seen him in action yet. Um Yeah, have we actually we haven't actually seen him yet. We saw the back of his head, right? Right. We've we've seen in the back of his head. We've seen him dropping some notes. We've seen his shadow. We saw his hand. We saw his hand, but we haven't seen him actually doing anything. Well, I can promise you that that is very very quickly about to change. So, um, and he's All pretty right. much going to be in it for the the rest of it. The other cut that we were going to watch tonight. Again, I'm going to wait to really go into what that entails later, but that other cut gets to the phantom action a lot sooner. Like it, it gets into it within the first like 20, 25 minutes, whereas this one takes 35 minutes to build up to it. A bit more so of a slow burn. A little bit more of a slow burn, and, and the other version is a little more phantom focused. So, you know, it's really a matter of preference, but. I'm I'm glad we're going with this cut tonight. Uh, again, it made it so I didn't have to choose between musical tracks and different tinted versions of the movies, some of which are god awful. Um, really bad tinting on one. It's like what the hell? Like, 
can barely see anything. It's too pink. So it, it honestly saved me a headache going with this version. But um, if you like this, you should check out the other versions because they're different. But uh, anything before we get into the exciting middle of the Phantom of the Opera? Is there really a Phantom? No, no, I think it's all just in Christine's head. I think she's I think she's gonna be committed to the asylum. Uh there's really no phantom. Yeah, there's no phantom. It's all in her mind. This is all this is just cabinet of Caligari. Caligari, again. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, not not much German expressionism in the shadows, but uh when it comes to the story, they definitely take a lot. Oh. Um <laughs> Well, I think on that note, we're going to go ahead and get into the exciting middle of The Phantom of the Opera right now. In spite of every warning, he tried to warn her in every way possible. Told you not to play Marguerite. Didn't listen. Look what you made me do. Oh, okay. The managers are doing... Okay, I like that. Taking a little gumption. Oh my God, that's a lot of people. <laughs> Don't speak too soon. Man, life is an understudy. You got to stand right there, all cost. Well, she's not quite all costumed up, but I'm ready to take the call, I guess. Thank you, sir. Is this the guy giving her a note? Okay. For a second, I was like, is that Raul? That doesn't look like Raul. <laughs> Phantom's like, what are you doing in my box? <laughs> <laughs> Get out of my box. I you know, told that lady. The Phantom and Shrek have a lot in common. They really do. At the end of the movie, she's going to wish to turn into a phantom. Right. That would have been the perfect ending. That was the ending they couldn't yeah, figure that out. They should. <laughs> that was the canceled ending. Yeah. That might have been. I think that would have tested better, though. Uh-oh. Then they can terrorize the opera together. <laughs> oh, there he goes. <laughs> Creeping. Creeping hard. <laughs> Ooh, I like mm. what they're doing with the title card, the inner title there. <laughs> oh, there it is. That's the note. Uh oh. Ah! Oh. <laughs> pandemonium, pandemonium in the Paris Opera House. I hope you guys have insurance. <laughs> it's curtains on on this production of Faust. Mm. 
This guy. <laughs> Just gonna sneak right by you here. <laughs> I need my top hat. Someone get me my top. I'm not <laughs> leaving here without my top hat. All these men running around dressed to the nines. No. Oh. On the catwalk. <laughs> Is the catwalk always a rope bridge like that? He looks like he was I Indiana didn't think Jones. So, yeah, not normally. Dang, just giving right in. Uh oh. <laughs> Not gonna say anything, just gonna watch her go uh, and just kinda. Ah, too late. Ah, just missed her. I'll never get through this mirror. <laughs> I don't want bad luck. <laughs> no breaking this thing down. I won't no find a man in all of France who's willing to break this thing down. <laughs> Dang, she is lost. I think she's traumatized from the chandelier collapsing and killing a bunch of people. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Cheney's amazing makeup. <laughs> but your face, it looks so <laughs> fake. You don't look much like your profile photo. <laughs> Yeah, I think I like you better as a shadow, like a weird dude in a mask. This works better for me when you're in another room. <laughs> it's not about how ugly I am. It's about how much I care about you. <laughs> Well, you got me hypnotized. She, she's definitely like hypnotized or enchanted or something. Yeah, that's. And they're choosing to to do what looks like a POV shot in a blurry kind of, you know, like that subjective like point of view because nothing else has been blurred. I think the blur was on purpose. Yeah, I don't think it was, it was an accident. I'm sorry, you just keep a horse underneath the Paris Opera House? <laughs> is, this, is there a trap door for the horse? Do we is get like a backstory show? on the horse? So the, how he ended up here in the <laughs> cellars of the Paris Opera House? Yeah, how come we don't get the like uh, introductory card mm -hmm. for him? Uh, was he played by the same horse from Dudley Do-Right, or what's the... 
I like that. Yeah, that's pretty nice. I mean, again, this was all part of their design of like trying to be realistic to how it looked of, okay, and then underneath is the, this is the basement. And I don't know. I mean, you can go and find kind of very detailed. You can't find the blueprints, I don't think, but you can find other detailed diagrams of the stages, the sets that were built for this film, replicating the Paris Opera House. <sighs> nice. steal your girl seriously like oh this is kind of romantic down here actually <laughs> all right okay phantom you're kind of sweeping me off my feet a little bit Damn. Wow. Down here in the aqueduct, like what what is this? Like a sewer? It must be the some kind of sewage system. I think that's what it's supposed to be. I bet it smells great down there. Oh yeah, just a river full of piss and shit. How romantic. Well, you know, and it's a <laughs> You, you don't want to even, you know, get a splash on you because it's also got a high alcoholic content. I mean, these these Frenchmen are just <laughs> pissing alcohol. In this, in this day and age, everybody was sauced all the time. Why do you think these opera managers are such buffoons? They're just liquored up. The only sober person in the whole movie is the Phantom. <laughs> I do really like the Phantom's lair. It's actually pretty sweet. It's pretty nice. Uh, I open layout. It's a uh, open open floor <laughs> plan. I uh, got a nice. Um, you, know, you got your bedroom area. You got your living room. You know, it's but it's all open. This panel swings open. It's a dishwasher. This is my pad. Uh, and it's this is the fits the proper definition of a pad because it's open floor plan, obviously. The Phantom was a fucking. Uh, I mean, he is kind of a a bro, you know, going through all this just to woo this opera understudy. <laughs> I don't care how talented he thinks she is. He's going for the understudies. He thinks she has low self esteem. Well, and you know, I mean, it goes without saying. This is what this is just all a toxic relationship. Oh, Jesus. That's a little forward. Yeah, she seemed like, okay. Let's, let's cool this down a little bit. I'm just I'm on your bed. You're talking to me about being aroused. I think we gotta slow this down a little bit. Is the Phantom the most famous incel? <laughs> he might be. I don't know. Some people might call Frankenstein's monster an incel. I don't know. Well. You know. He's a freak. That's sick. How, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is the most romantic. Women love this. What are you talking about? They're each other's twin flames. <laughs> if you haven't seen that terrifying documentary, there's a cult out there that basically operating under this. <laughs> if you really love somebody and they don't love you back, 
Try harder. <laughs> they will love you eventually. You're meant to be together. That's the Phantom Soul ethos. You. We'll talk about the difference between this and the novel and other versions. But other versions play up on the Phantom as a musical genius. and he, That's why he's into her and all this stuff. <laughs> this is in the book. This and this movie are a little more nebulous. And why is he just, you know, developing this obsession with this woman? Um, it's definitely a little more toxic than other adaptations would, <laughs> you know, try to wash away later. It's a good line. That's that's a classic monster justification it's only because mankind made me this way he wrote that in his diary down here right after why don't women like nice guys <laughs> <laughs> All alone, sitting in front of my computer all day. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. I like that. The Phantom. Uh oh, too strong. Came well, too strong. <laughs> yeah, the mask is interesting. It is kind of like. I don't know. It's low. It's pretty. It's creepy. The little like, is it like tassels? Yeah, I think that's what Essink is saying. Looks like Swiss cheese. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I think it, it almost makes him look like he's um, you know, Davy Jones. He's got like a, it's almost like a little squid mouth. What Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean? Oh, He's got, like, yeah, a face. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that. Da oh, I, I was wrong. That was not his bed. This is his bedroom, and it's not open floor plan. <laughs> My goodness, look at that. That, that is, is an uh, immaculate bed suite. Where did he get that? <laughs> I don't know, but I want to... I mean, he lives under the opera, Evan. You imagine all the fabric <laughs> sourcing you're able to do. It just floats down through the sewer. You want to have a HGTV level decorated boudoir. You can do it all yourself <laughs> if you live under the opera. And dumpster dive. That's all you have to do. Yeah, I bet the, the homeless in Paris live very sumptuously. <laughs> yeah she did and what did you do about it I mean come on you could have gotten through that wall there's an impenetrable barrier He just wanted a cavalry behind him. He could have gone in there on his own <laughs> if he wanted to. He could have done that first thing. Uh, I actually, I want to get help. Can I phone a friend? Every male character is just like a little afraid. Yeah, <laughs> they, they are. Oh, this is the most comfortable bed I've ever been in. What is what is it? What is this? Silk sheets? Oh god, I've gotta stop drinking absinthe. Is that like a boat bed? Is the is that what it is? <laughs> With like a babe like a cupid, <laughs> little cupid on the bow of it or the whatever that is right there? My goodness. I love, yeah, pretty neat indeed. Let it be known. I, I, I make it big one day. That'll be what my bedroom looks like. You're going to sleep in a boat. Covered in curtains, fresh flowers on the, 
on the I know there's some douchey word for whatever that that uh table is there. Um <laughs> Oh man. Living opulently. <laughs> well, you know, you gotta Wow. Yeah, I mean. Do you think he wrote that, or did he, did he have that custom made? Ah, uh, you know, again. Or did he just find a mirror that said, or did mm, he steal a, her mirror? No, I think that uh, again, you're living in the opera house. You got access to all kinds of prop making tools. You can engrave your own mirror, and you just you paint it. Stencil. Eric. That is the phantom's name. Very not threatening name. Yeah, Er Eric. I love and, organ music. <laughs> it's not supposed to match up, I, but it's it is a little dis like this in it. That's why some other there are some scores where they have organ music during this part, or the score that I preferred was more orchestral, and it just does a big thing here that I really like, but that was the other version of this movie that is uh, just a different cut. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Victory is mine. Don't look. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. It's mm. <laughs> the cool thing about silent movies is you know exactly what she's thinking. They don't she doesn't have to say anything. They don't have to give you any inner titles. And then it just happens. Most one of the most iconic moments in silent film history right here. <laughs> this is gonna cast a spell I think that the phantom is supposed to be like a like they call have called him like a conjurer oh, okay. not in this but in the book I think specifically Feast your eyes, glut your soul on my accursed ugliness. I feel like F Frankenstein's monster may say that in the book. Mm. I don't know. Maybe it's just from this movie that I've heard that, but I swear I've heard that line outside of this. Sounds like it could be. If not, he says in the book, Frankenstein's monster says something very close. 
Now you know my secret, Christine. I'm super ugly. Yeah, I want you out there singing more. You're a lover. getting a cramp from all this professing of my love. <laughs> I'm honestly so stressed out right now. I thought maybe we could hang later, but now I think I'm just going to go to bed. <laughs> Mysterious message. Mysterious massage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what that means. What? The, that's where'd you come from? <laughs> <laughs> so this is another. The ball mask is what's coming up, and. And the other version of this, the ball mask sequence, is in color. Here, black and white. And that was like the one thing making me want to choose the other version because it hits different in color. Like, the Phantom. Oh my god. I mean, it's still good here, but you'll... <sighs> Party! They are having a ball mask. Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. you, you versus get, the clown. Hey, you don't get paid extra for that stunt guy, okay? <laughs> you clown on your own time. <laughs> Jeez Louise Chaos got to definitely be like a few hundred people there. So in the color version, the red is just mm. I'm the Red Death, and I'm here to spoil your party. <laughs> I know that voice. Love the mask.
Yeah, it's a pretty sick getup. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Curse you, Eric. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what he was saying. That's pretty wild. I don't know. Oh, there's birds flying wow. around it? Damn. I mean, I guess they built that. That looks like... I mean, that's not like a fucking... mat. It's not... Uh, just a... painted 2D thing. It looks like a full sculpture. State talking mm. shit about the phantom behind his back. Man, ready to go. Hell yeah. So in the other version of this, the Phantom's cape is colored red here. Like the lining of his cape is colored red. <laughs> now you're going to get it. <laughs> what? Did you hear something? No, no, it's all right. It sounded like someone said, women always go for jocks. <laughs> Man, you want to talk about a jock? Look at Lon Chaney up there freaking... <laughs> Climbing on the edge of this thing, acrobat that he is. I mean, in real life, though, I mean, again, we talked about it when we watched Hunchback. And as Quasimodo, I mean, you do see him swinging on things and climbing on things. It was things. like Tarzan in that movie. Yeah, I mean, he definitely obviously was very physically strong and could do... He had a stunt double in Hunchback, but I mean, he was doing a lot of stuff himself. And I think here, obviously... <laughs> I mean, he's having to do some, you know, some climbing and some hanging and all that fun stuff. Party's still in full swing. Yeah, they didn't let a little phantom stop them. You should have fucking killed somebody on the spot. Party seemed a lot more fun back in the day. Everybody's oh just my running God, around. Yeah. <laughs> be a little less cryptic guy They're like um okay yeah thanks guy don't don't even like who are you like what are you doing here why do you know 
What do you know that we don't know? Like, <laughs> nope. No questions asked. It's okay. He has a nose. Oh, shit. Look out. Oh, my God. Was he, but was that dude just sparring with himself in the mirror, though? <laughs> <laughs> Phantom, uh, Strangler, Ghost. We can have a million names for this guy. A master of black art. Okay. Yeah. Escaped. Now Aaron. at large. <laughs> he escaped from an insane asylum. I am the enchanter, Eric. The Phantom over the Opera. <laughs> yeah, you saw you cracked this case wide open. And that is gonna take us to our second break. What are we thinking so far, Evan? Uh, things are heating up. We're getting pretty deep in the phantom zone. I mean, yeah, we've, we've gotten... We've been to the phantom zone and back. Plenty of phantom unmasked in the last uh, 20 minutes, you know? Uh, so that's been nice, right? You know, finally yeah, get to like see Lon the, Chaney at work. All the lawn action. Yeah, I, I mean, he's obviously killing it. It's It's funny how under such heavy makeup, how expressive... He is. And I mean, again, it comes from his background. It comes from the fact that he was, uh, you know, he was a child of deaf adults and he learned a lot about mime and, and, uh, pantomime in particular was his, like one of his strong suits. And he brought that to the stage. Like that was where he started. And that was one of the big things he said about the makeup in tonight's film is that, he really learned a lot of the tricks that he used for the makeup from his time on the stage. He learned how to play with certain shades of makeup in the right place, you know, the right shadows and the right contours with makeup um, to create the kind of look that he got. Um, but it was a, obviously a, I mean, there was a lot going into the makeup. You can tell. I mean, if you and I should have had it queued up a side by side of Lon Chaney no makeup with Lon <laughs> Chaney phantom makeup because I mean, you like I'm sure in 1925 that people were really taken aback to know that this is Lon Chaney because he is pulling out all the stops to not look like himself. Um, and just a little, if you want a little rundown on the makeup, sure. Um, Eamon created himself, designed himself. He was a makeup genius. That's why he was called the man of a thousand faces. But, and again, like I said, uh, earlier in the show, he was inspired by an illustration of the novel and he called it a death's head. Look, that was what he was going for. So he stuffed wadding into his cheeks, which you can tell his cheekbones are, or, you know, or his cheeks are definitely puffed out. Um, he wore a skull cap, obviously, with, you know, wisps of hair on it. Glued his ears to back to his head. <laughs> yeah. Painted his eye sockets black and, like, kind of white around, like, the edges. Like, really make his eyes pop. Attached prongs to a set of fall, rotted false teeth which he put in his mouth, um, coated his lips in grease paint. And then for the nose, again, that look of having no nose, that was where it seems like he did a lot of different things. So he used putty to kind of like sharpen the angle, but he also had like guide wires. Like he had, uh, he had two loops of wires that like, in each not he had a loop of wire in each nostril to like open it up and then he had another wire under the putty that pulled the 
the wire nostrils back that like huh. opened it up. And apparently it was um according to the cinematographer, it was all so excruciating for Cheney that he would bleed oh, like geez. hell. He would believe so. He could only wear the makeup for short stints. Yeah, talk at about a time. committing to the bit. Yeah, what a I mean, trooper. what was the same thing for the Hunchback? He put himself through this excruciating makeup that he could only wear for like fifteen minutes at a time. Had to take it off because it was, you know, he had like a glass eye in his own eye. He had like you know, mm. like this you know, 15 pound like hump on his back, you know, I mean, he just really went out there for the makeup. And after the, the big success of hunchback, you got to top yourself, you know, you got, <laughs> I mean, again, when you, you're called the man of a thousand faces, you can't settle, you know, you got to keep finding a way to up the ante. Any great makeup man, you know, whether you're talking about Jack Pierce, who made the Universal Monsters, or Rick Baker, who, you know, was inspired by the Universal Monsters and won Oscars for things like American Werewolf in London and the Wolfman remake. I mean, it is a testament to, you know, when you really put the time in your makeup, I mean, you're going to get something that becomes a cultural touchstone. I mean, and that's the thing about like this look of Cheney in the movie. I mean, it really was an instant phenomenon, basically. And and he tried it out too. I mean, according to the cinematographer, I don't know if this is true, if this is true, but he said that the reaction of the lead actress, Mary Philbin, to the makeup and the unmasking scene, he said it was genuine because she hadn't seen the makeup <laughs> before. I don't know if that's true. He also said that Lon tried the makeup out on him. He said that Lon had called him to his dressing room. Um, he like looked in there, didn't see him. And then all of a sudden he turned around and like Lon was in a corner like popped out and Van Inger said he like fell over, like <laughs> literally was scared so much. And like, he was like, he fell back and then was so mad. Like he was pissed. And he said, uh, he, what did he say to Cheney? He said, uh, let's see. He said, uh, damn, I don't, I don't know. I can't find it, but he was basically, he was just yeah, like, really, really pissed at Lon. And Lon was like, I got everything I need. I I got my answer. I figured out what I needed <laughs> just by your reaction. So that was like, I don't know if that those stories are true. Um, and Charles Van Inger, you know, I don't, the only other horror movie that he has to his name of repute is Avant Costello meet Frankenstein. So, you know, I mean, the man obviously, was in the business for a while. I mean, you maybe could trust what he says, but some of these stories kind of, you know, some people like to play up the details a little bit. And we, we were talking about that with plan nine last week, you know, the way that everybody's got a different version of how things happen. Oh yeah. Everybody um, embellishes their own way. And speaking of different versions, we're going to talk about after the break about how, you know, we talked all I've bandied about all night about how there are different versions of this, but um, you know, I'll kind of explain exactly what that is when we come back from the break. Uh, but first we're going to get two trailers for other adaptations of Phantom of the Opera, both from universal. And um, the first one was their kind of their big remake of Phantom. They, uh, in 1943, remade it, starring Claude Rains as the Phantom, who Claude Rains had played the Invisible Man in the first Invisible Man movie, and a few years before the remake of Phantom, he was the father of Lon Chaney Jr.'s character in The Wolfman. <laughs> so it was a little there funny that, <laughs> yeah, that somehow uh you know I, I i don't remember if i read if lon cheney jr lobbied for the role of the phantom in the remake he might have but i know that it 
to me it was funny that he, they gave it to Claude Rains when you know he played which they don't you know Lon uh Lon and uh Lon Jr. and Claude Rains don't look anything alike. People always make fun of the fact that they played father and son of the Wolfman. <laughs> um but they uh you know uh Claude Rains does a pretty good job, but this movie was the one that kind of creates this whole backstory for the Phantom as this musical genius who was in love with Christine's voice and was trying to make music for her and then was scarred by acid. And if you've ever heard that version of the story, um, that, that is, uh, that was created for the 43 version and has been recycled a few times. Um, I think Phantom of the Paradise, the, or no. Oh God. I forgot about how he gets disfigured in that. He falls into a vinyl press and gets his like <laughs> half his face press. Like again, satire uh, and parody. Um, but you know, uh, 43 phantom acid in the face. The other trailer we're going to see is for a version from 62. I believe I don't remember how the phantom is disfigured in that version. In that version, he's played by an actor named Herbert Lom. You probably won't know the name, but if I tell you that he played uh, in the Pink Panther movies with Peter Sellers, he was Inspector Dreyfus, the mm. um, the chief inspector of the Sûreté, who uh, is constantly exasperated at Clouseau's um absurdities and then in one movie becomes a super villain and in one scene in the film he's in this like castle basement he's at the organ playing the piano and i'm pretty sure it's a nod to the fact that he played phantom of the opera in this 60s movie which was also produced by hammer films which was the big british horror movie company during the late 50s 60s 70s um they partnered with universal on a few films and this was one of the films that they partnered together and it's a it's a very different version of phantom because instead of the paris opera house it takes place at the london opera house you know those Brits refused to get along with the with the French. <laughs> We're not going to make a movie. We're going to do it at our own opera house. Um, I'm pretty sure the 43 version, they shot on the same exact sets, obviously, because stage 28 was still in its heyday, and the sets were still pretty in pretty good shape. So, um, But uh, the, the 60s version is British shot, British made, and it still looks pretty good. Um, it's one of those movies I tune out of. So, uh, But I have seen the 43 version a lot. I was kind of obsessed with it as a kid, even though it's a straight-up musical. It's a fair warning. Not in the phantom musical sense, but just in the classic Hollywood musical sense. So it's kind of annoying. I don't like classic Hollywood <laughs> musicals. I've never liked classic Hollywood musicals, but this is a classic Hollywood musical. So um, you will enjoy it. We'll get these two trailers and then we come back to the exciting conclusion of the Phantom of the Opera. So stick around. We'll be right back. all you've ever wanted in entertainment in one superb show. Here is matchless story, suspenseful, terrifying, never so thrillingly presented. Here in breathtaking technicolor is superb spectacle and splendor and romance. Here is a chorus of a hundred voices, a ballet of a hundred dancers, a cast of a thousand, starring Nelson Eddy in his most vigorous performance, lovely Susanna Foster, and Claude Rains in the most coveted role of the year as the Phantom of the Opera. My music! You've stolen it! You've stolen my music! Dad!
if you dare, within these walls. On stage is color, beauty, and light. But in the shadows lurks a monstrous evil. Young woman, you must come with me. Terror haunts these dusty corridors. Murder waits its call in the dressing rooms. And on cue, death makes his entrance. to love and happiness, for this beautiful young girl is tangled in a web of terror. The Phantom of the Opera, the hideous echo of a night of agony and horror. A night that must be avenged, even from beyond the grave. So that was a trailer for the trailers for two other adaptations of Phantom of the Opera released by Universal. And, you know, again, they, those movies are responsible for kind of setting forth some of the other tropes associated with the Phantom story that aren't from the novel. And again, even the movie tonight is not really it's not really sticking to the novel when it comes to the phantom and his backstory. Yeah. Which details did that one add? So, um, and the other ones, he comes from a musical background. Like in both of those, I'm pretty sure he's from a musical background. And in the 43 version, they were going to make it where he's her father, but then either because there's also kind of still the romantic thing. They're like, is this incest? Should we? <laughs> so they had like, so it, it's this weird kind of really falls in a weird place. Christine, I just want some quality father daughter bonding. Time. Yeah, it's really awkward. Uh, the 40 ver- 40s version and then the 60s version. I don't think they play it that way, but I think there still is like he's a he's a musician. He's a genius musician. They're both that way. And um, the the movie that we're watching and the story, he doesn't come from a like mu- like entirely musical background. Like I they so we saw that scene just before we went to break, there was a little scene where it showed a little card about the phantom. Like it had like some investigative information. It said something about him being a musician. It mentioned something. I can't remember what it said. Um but the background here is uh, supposed to be that he was some kind of like torture who like worked under the basement, who worked in the basement of the, there was a, like a torture chamber in the basement of the opera house. I don't know quite. It gets really confusing. Um and so, but the original novel, apparently he was the uh, conjurer for a, uh, let's see, what was it? For a Parisian, no, not Parisian, Persian. For like a Persian uh, princess or something like that. And 
Hold on, I gotta find this. I don't have this. Okay, so yeah, he's a Persian executioner who fell out of favor with the whoever was in charge, and so he was sentenced to be eaten to death by ants. And so he's <laughs> and so he's rescued by this character in the book who's called the Persian, who was the chief of police for the the same like regime or something, and he saves. Eric, who but his face is already been oh, the eaten off by the face. ants. So that's ants. in the book. That's and a lot of the backstory of the Phantom is provided by this Persian character who pops up in the opera. Well, in the movie tonight, you know, we've seen this guy who's and he was just in the police, you know, he was just with the you know chief of police or whatever that guy is and he's wearing the hat yeah, he was the guy who that. said don't use that door use that door yeah. he's been kind of mysterious the whole time well that's this character for in who in the novel was called the persian in this movie he's called ludo and instead of being a um you know, kind of somebody who's connected to the Phantom's past. He's just an, a police inspector who's been investigating the Phantom and has this information about the Phantom. Um, but apparently that was done in the inner titles. You know, little hands off for a p- p- policeman. Well, well, that's what's so weird about this is that like... That's why it doesn't make sense because the inner titles... M- were the thing that made it that way. He was apparently shot as he was shot with the understanding that he's the Persian and that he's this mysterious character, but he's connected to the, the past of the phantom. But then the inner titles were changed to kind of turn him into this different character and simplify the story, I guess, ultimately. So in, do you know in, in the original, did he still play the pipe organ or was that completely just added later? It, so that was a funny thing that we saw um, in that second Phantom trailer, the 60s version. That was where the the Bach, uh, is it Takata and Fugue? Uh, I, I, I think so. Uh. That got associated with the Phantom because of that version. He's playing that Bach composition on a pipe organ um and i don't think the i don't know if the i don't remember if the 40s one has a pipe organ or not um so yeah that wasn't i guess that came along later and maybe it's in the novel i don't know i really i don't remember a lot wasn't he playing an organ in, in this one he was playing an organ but it wasn't it didn't look like like a a big pipe it wasn't a big pipe organ this is definitely he was he had an organ going um so i mean it's it's funny you know the you know different adaptations they're always kind of seems like they've been tweaking it as they went along but this is actually the closest to the novel so yeah go figure that's kind of kind of an interesting thing so um we're about to get into the exciting conclusion of the phantom of the opera anything before we get into it evan Play us on Phantom. Da 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> on that note. Baroche? On the rotunda? <laughs> Such fancy words. Baroche, rotunda. Blithely. Blithely. Oh, that's very blithely. <laughs> nice. My goodness. So many ballerinas. It's 
cannot imagine the magnitude of that shot. Yeah, oh trying to coordinate that shit. I mean, in a silent movie, it's got to be a little easier because you're not having to actually worry about sound. <laughs> you not worry about anybody like saying anything <laughs> out of character or inappropriate. seems kind of easy to make a deal with the devil like you just like, you just have to ask for it. you just ask and he shows up well he's desperate obviously <laughs> yeah yeah that means you have leverage <laughs> <laughs> you can have anything you want <laughs> the devil picks up on the first <laughs> ring of the phone mm -hmm. well i pray to god and have to wait a, a while while you can get <laughs> the devil right away <laughs> yeah, you're gonna get put on hold you <laughs> yeah. call heaven you call heaven <laughs> you want you want you want action you want answers you go to hell <laughs> Sounds like you need a new plan. He may not have a nose, but he has ears. Okay. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was an easy one. All right, I'll, I'll see myself out. His sense of hearing's been heightened. <laughs> when you lose one sense, of hearing. Uh, I think his sense of skin has also been heightened. <laughs> uh, you know, wearing fake a fake face on top of your face all day, you know, eventually. See, she called him a monster. But, you know, Chaney is very much of the mind that his characters are sympathetic. They, they sacrifice a lot, you know, like... <laughs> All right, I'm tired of these baroches, okay? I've never heard the word before. It's the first time I'm hearing it. I don't like it. You can get glue traps for those, you know. <laughs> I've heard they're indestructible. <laughs> Uh-oh. You're on. <laughs> Phantom be damned. We got a show to put on, all right? <laughs> You know that the life's blood of Paris depends on us to put this opera on every week? <sighs> Diabolical. <laughs> Ooh, that's a nice shot. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that shot. At that as a kid cracked me up. <laughs> Can you imagine being on stage and then you're like, oh no, my stalker is right here. And I have to keep singing. Gone. You better get down there. Should have been down there waiting in the wings. Damn it. <laughs> I 
She's disintegrated. She's been raptured. Take orders from me. <laughs> so yeah, this is the inner title is that they did not shoot it thinking that that's who this character was. And the actor playing that character uh, was actually in uh, two early Technicolor horror films, Dr. X and Mystery of the Wax Museum with Lionel Atwell. He has some pretty good roles in both movies. Arthur Edmund Carey? I don't know how you say that. C R K C A R E W E. Carey? I don't know. That's strange. But he was born in Armenia and his na uh, uh, his birth name was Hovsep Hovsepian, which is easier than Arthur Edmund Carey. <laughs> Nowadays, Hopsep Hopsepian would be a more bankable name. Back then, you had to Americanize it. Sad. We'll scare the Phantom with our pretend guns. Well, you know, it, it, as long as it looks like a gun in a shadow, that's going to scare the <laughs> hell out of the Phantom. That's He mostly sees in shadows. No, they're just, they've just got their slapping hands ready. It looks pretty ridiculous. <laughs> Just finger gun in the whole whole thing. So in the 40s version, these two characters are basically romantic rivals for Christine. There's, I think, another thing that gets carried in some adaptations. That she has multiple people kind of vying for her. Um, which they don't do here, but in the 40s version, it's like... The movie freaking ends with her taking both the guys out to dinner and it's just kind of like it's a little awkward for the 40s because they just don't know they don't know what they're doing Jesus, that's scary. Wait for it. Who is that? Turn back air ye perish. Oh my God. There's another a homeless man living in the sewer warning people. <laughs> You're not going to survive down here in those tuxes. Yeah, you two stick out like sore thumbs down here. <laughs> you got a lot to learn about living in the sewer. <laughs> First day, huh? <laughs> Try 
trying to cheat the phantom i talk in the third person now <laughs> I made you. Uh oh. <laughs> I feel like we're borderline yikes here. Yeah. <laughs> kind of yikes territory. You will give me love. <laughs> Let's go, boys. Hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. All right. Re rest of the stream. Corey, right. Trevor, put your hands down. <laughs> <Oop>. <laughs> hands down. Down in the pit. The pit. Many mirrors. What? <laughs> the room of many mirrors. You're falling into the fun house. An old torch. Yes. Yeah, the fun house. The torture of getting lost in a maze of mirrors. I don't want to show you my gross face. Let me just sing to you for a little bit. That'll that'll ease the tension. <laughs> that'll help smooth things over. I am human like other men. Yeah, it's all you're all it's supposed to all be sing, sung these in her titles. Woo! <laughs> Raul's brother. Is that his alarm? Is that Warden there? P like, that'd be so cool. You know, instead of just an alarm that like buzzes a high pitched sound, you have like it just kind of clanks. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Big... Nice. <laughs> Won't be needing this. Just take this coat off and. <laughs> just going for a little dip oh man you're gonna ruin your makeup <laughs> you only get one shot of this as soon as I go into the water it's gonna take me another five hours to take this makeup off and put new makeup back on My God, they actually have him in the water. His skull cap is not holding up very well. <laughs> I'm sure Lon Chaney could swim. I bet he was a good swimmer. I mean, again, he grew up like kind of in the outdoors. like we're turning to jaws now wherever the <laughs> wherever the snorkel's going oh held up pretty well I guess he's not worried about, you know, getting water all in his nice 
little apartment. Floor's about to be ruined. All that piss and shit water that he's going to be tracking in. I mean, think about it. Look at him. He just got out of that water, and all he's doing is putting his cloak oh, back God. on. Christine's just going to pass out from how much he reeks. <laughs> Does he do that a lot if he has a special holder for his snorkel? Probably, yeah. He's well, got two. It was lurking around down in the sewer. Yeah, it's not a pipe organ. What is that little hat? Where do you get that? Hit him over the head. Oh. This movie doesn't really bother explaining the whole thing with the Phantom. Like, why he is the way he is, why he does what he does, but the book definitely goes there. <laughs> We're gonna find that Phantom, and I'm going to avenge the death of my brother, who was killed by the Phantom. again why won't you just love me <laughs> you can't do this one <laughs> thing for me <laughs> do you hear what I hear <laughs> Intolerable heat. <laughs> Burning up in here, guy. So, in tinted versions of this, like the stuff in there with them is tinted red. Really giving you the heat. Break the mirrors. Damn, bad luck be damned. <laughs> no, I'm done being polite. Shit. Now that's a mob. Yeah, for real. We'll get the whole town after. My, yeah, the, the all of Paris. Oh, shit. He can't strangle all of us. <laughs> you know what I want. Yeah, what a creep. 
。啊、哦。God, look at him. Is it a way out? Oh shit! <laughs> gotcha. Damn the eyes. Damn your eyes. Got a whole stockpile down there. <laughs> okay, he just turned into the guy from Saw. <laughs> nice cat. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is, look at that. Yeah, that's one of the iconic images. Yeah, he's mugging hard, sweet pea. No. Christine, what have you done? Oh, this wire stinks. Gave in pretty quick. Yeah, very quick.
Yeah, I mean, Sweet V, that's essentially, he's just really ugly guy. You know, he tried to force this woman to be in a relationship. That really worked out for him. His real problem is he's ugly on the inside. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh shit. Here come the villagers. Yeah, he just let them ran. <laughs> I Still told taking you, you with me. Those torches are safe down there. Yeah. Especially in the room with all the curtains. In this enclosed space where there's probably not that much oxygen. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, a lot just, of different. Just put a lot of fire toxins, down here. Yeah, going around. Oh my god. Riding off into the sunset. Go, Phantom, go. God, yes, yeah, you'll get trampled. <laughs> That's the cathedral set from Hunchback. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> swarming him oh my god I hope those dudes can swim oh they beat the shit out of him De oh dead alright wow Vanquished. We did it. Yay. We survived the phantom. <laughs> we survived your crazy stalker. Finny. Really? You're going to end it on Finny? Oh, my goodness. Well, there it is. That was the Phantom of the Opera. And 
you know, the ending, I mean, an interesting little tidbit about the ending. Uh, but I'll go ahead and ask you, Evan, uh, what did you think? I mean, I thought it was pretty good. The ending felt like it came on a little quick. Yeah. But that's not super unusual for, you know, these old movies. 100%. Definitely not unusual. Although, good of you to notice because it's not part of what was originally shot. Um, yeah, I'm curious. What was the what was the original so, ending? Again, yeah. And then talking about all the different versions of this, basically... When the very first version they shot, the ending was that Christine gives the Phantom a kiss. And he's so overcome that he dies of a broken heart. He literally, <laughs> like, uh, at his organ, like, just dies. And that was one of the reasons why the test audiences were so pissed off. Right? Uh. So that was the very first version. The second version added the whole angry mob thing, right? But it had all this comic relief stuff nobody liked. So the third cut that came out in 1925 had the original version plus the ending of the angry mob. But the original ending to that cut was Phantom Dying of a Broken Heart, which... Um, footage of that does not exist, but apparently there are still pictures uh, of that ending. So it's kind of a weird thing about that. Um, but that, you know, yeah, that that's... And I think maybe the novel kind of ends that way. He dies of a broke... Like, he has some kind of transformation. But, you know, I think the audience is right in wanting something a little more, you know, a little more of a vanquishing for the phantom and that's what we got yeah um so so that was welcome and this is really you know again so you had those three cuts and then in 1929 they decided to release a version with some sound they were going to make a sequel they had optioned the rights to make a sequel but was the phantom come back it was the return of the phantom oh and yeah, from they they uh optioned it from LaRose estate, but uh they didn't have Cheney under contract anymore. So they decided, well, let's just re-release the old version just with some sound and we'll reshoot some of the stuff. So the version that is known very widely as public domain and is a very high quality copy is basically an amalgamation of footage shot in the very original between those three different cuts footage from the sound version shot in 1929. Um, and then footage from what people have suspected was a foreign release print. And apparently what happened was when they were shooting the original movie, they had two cameras side by side. Okay, the room style. The room, exactly the room style. And one was for, I don't know why they did it this way. This was just practice, but one was for uh, domestic prints to be made of and the other was for foreign prints. To, it was to be like sent overseas, I guess, for like... I don't know. I really don't know why it worked that way. They shot one in metric and the other in imperial. Essentially, yeah. And so you basically, there are two different angles of everything that they Mm. shot. And then there's just different takes. And so Universal basically made an entirely different cut that they submitted to the George Eastman house, which is like a film preservation um, house. And this version that is known as the Eastman print, it's, it's not the 29 sound version. It's not any of the three silent cuts. It's not a version that was released to television. It is a, version that is just bits and pieces of every cut 
inexplicably <laughs> put together. Um, but that's what you'll find. But there are great restorations of it and it's a beautiful clean print and there's tinting on them and there's great musical scores so if you like tonight's film go check out those other versions because just by virtue of the tinting score color sequences and a faster pace you may enjoy it more i mean if we were you know when we get to the point if we start re-watching some films i mean we'd probably opt for you know, the other version of the Phantom. And yeah, I mean, it might be cool to see it, you know, in color. I think so. Yeah, I mean, that one sequence, the the ball mass sequence hits so different when you see. And I mean, even this version has the color sequence in it. Um, but again, tonight was what they actually watched in 25. So we went pure tonight. I think that was the, the way to go. And it was good to see, again, this was Cheney at his peak. This is considered the peak of Lon Chaney's uh, makeup and acting talents. And can, you, uh, can I ask you how sympathetic do you think this version of the Phantom is? Not super sympathetic. Not you know? yeah. You give him more of a backstory, and I'm sure that they. I think it seems like they shot it with the intention originally that he would be sympathetic. Like apparently, there's a scene in the book where the phantom is at Christine's father's graveside and like soothes her, soothes her while she's upset. Mm -hmm. And they shot this in the original version and then deleted it by the time we got the, the final version they released in 25. So, um, yeah. And, and you're right. I think Andrew Lloyd Webber did do a sequel to the musical, called it's not called like love never dies or something it's something like that you wouldn't know it's a phantom secret it's not the return of the phantom which is a better title if you want to know it's a sequel somehow the phantom of the opera has returned well i mean again yeah love now it was love never dies oh my <laughs> god that was that's a very cliched Broadway musical title. That's why it didn't, it didn't last very long. It definitely didn't have the longevity of the original Phantom musical. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you just kind of had this really um, storied history with this movie. And there's so many different alternate versions out there. And it's kind of the cool and weird thing about it. We'll actually, we'll get to watch a 1937 Japanese adaptation of Phantom of the Opera. Eventually, it's public domain. Uh, it's called Song at Midnight. And um, I think it's also a very long movie, but it's sound and uh, early Japanese horror. And um, apparently, it's a very, very good adaptation of Phantom of the Opera. Um, and obviously different because it's coming from Japan and we're not getting the, again, this movie kind of why you'd consider it universal horror. You have this gruesome makeup, you know, you're playing with shadows, you're playing with elaborate sets, but then you also just have this European setting, right? Um, that's the thing that the universal horror movies all kind of have in common <laughs> really yeah. between them is that they just some in some nondescript European locale. Obviously here we are in Paris, but it's just kind of setting a tone as did hunchback, but hunchback's a little less horror. And here you got to see why Cheney senior. Now I'm going to call him senior. Cause I'm bringing up junior. But you see why senior would be called a horror star or a horror movie actor because of this film tonight. Um, that's why he has the reputation for being a horrific movie star, even though he really, he was just more considered a great makeup acting talent. Not he's a horror man like Karloff and Lugosi, um, or his son. So that, that's kind of the difference. You know, his son was squarely typecast in the, you're a horror guy role. And he wanted desperately to have what his father had, which was to be considered a great talent um, outside of just, you know, being scary. Uh, so, I mean, I think I, you know, we got to see Cheney on full display tonight. So it was, it was very good. And 
Um, we'll get a few more Cheney move Cheney senior movies on the stream. So, uh, that was not the end of it tonight, but, uh, that was our only silent film for the season. We'll only do one normally. Um, and so we're going to be taking next week off. We will be celebrating Thanksgiving. Uh, and then we will be right back at it, of course, with our mini sods on Wednesday at 9 p.m. and our with our third installment of The Whispering Shadow. And then uh, two Fridays from now at 9 p.m. Eastern, we'll be back with our third film of season eight. It's an early 1960s film called The Dungeon of Horror. Maybe The Dungeon of Horror, but there's different titles on it. And the, 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 Title credits on it say horror, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe it's supposed to be horror. I don't. They must have died while writing it. I don't know <laughs> how it seems. And dude, this is going to be so much fun. This is a regional color version of the Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe films out of Texas. <laughs> a great. So and it's made by like some film students and a guy who would go on to he did something he created a comic book character hmm. the um the one that John Cena played uh oh peacemaker I think that's what it is uh I think that's what it is whatever his name is uh but this guy directed this regional horror movie that apparently is a lot like the terror which we watched all the way back in season one. S sync says yes, peacemaker. So, um, yeah. So if you want to watch a really obscure regional horror film directed by a man who would go on to create a, what, you know, still relevant piece of IP, you can join us two Fridays from now at 9 PM for the dungeon of horror. <laughs> definitely died while writing it um of course if you want to catch up on any of our past episodes over the break you can go find us over on youtube at scream stream live got a lot of great stuff over there of course if you want to go follow the show on the socials figure out what we're going to be showing next what drinks we're going to be having the recipes you can go follow us over on instagram uh at scream stream show also on x and tiktok at scream stream show if you want to follow me you can go find me over on x at spakenstein and of course mr evan sink is over on x and instagram at caligari cursed anything i know this was a late episode i know we ran later tonight uh so my you know again it was a longer movie. We all knew. We yeah, chose the longer and cut. And thanks for everybody for sticking around. Yeah, we do it. And we appreciate everybody tuning in. We appreciate S-Sync. Lively in the chat. Sweet feet, of course, everybody that hopped in tonight. We appreciate you guys as always. It was a fun movie. Um, yeah. Any Anything else before we sign off for the break? Do you think the reason the Phantom sleeps in a boat is because if Paris gets a heavy rain, that room just totally floods. <sighs> that logic is airtight. That's something to, something to think about. I, I will be thinking about that all break. Until two weeks from now. Sweet screams, everybody. And to all, a good fright.